Welcome to worship here at Glendale First United Methodist Church. As always, it's our joy and our privilege to have you join us this day, whatever that day is for you, as we come together to worship the risen Lord. It's our hope that during this time together that you'll experience God's presence with you, that you'll come either to faith in Jesus Christ or grow in your faith in Jesus Christ, and that together as followers of His, we can help to make His difference in the world. Today, uh, we are continuing in our Lenten journey. Uh, Lent is the 40 days, not counting Sundays, that leads us to Easter. And I'll be talking a little more about what that means later on in the service. But we're also continuing to focus on our discipleship journey. And that is the specific way that we are going about here at Glendale First of trying to be faithful followers of Christ. We do have many opportunities for ministry going on right now. Uh, you can find all of those on our website, glendalefirst.org. So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to worship. And we ask here and now, wherever we are and whatever it is that we're experiencing, that you would help us to have the open hearts, the open minds that we need to be able to experience you. And during this time of worship, gracious God, we ask that you would again help us to be reminded of, to experience again the love that you have for each and every one of us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, really no matter what, that you love us anyway. And that in response to that, gracious God, that we might seek to share that love throughout all the world. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Our gospel reading for today is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 and 11b through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to, feed, to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he had came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran out and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be still, my soul.
Today we are continuing our sermon series for this season of Lent, which again is the 40 days, not counting Sundays, that leads us up to Easter, a time in the history of the church that has been set aside for us who are followers of Christ, who consider ourselves to be Christians, uh, become more intentional about what it is for us um, to be faithful, to be faithful people, to live as those who are reconciled to God and seek to be reconciled, to live in peace with one another. And so these practices that we've been talking about uh, that in create our discipleship journey, the intentional ways in which we are going about being followers of Christ that include authentic worship and transformative education, God-honoring relationships, works of justice and compassionate, uh, sacrificial giving, and now passionate spirituality, these are the things that we're seeking to do. Passionate spirituality in particular are engaging in, in spiritual disciplines and practices that help us to be, um, to change our hearts, to change our minds in such a way so they become more like Jesus, more like God in Christ that we see so that, that we can be these people, that we can be these Christians or these little uh, images of Christ, these little representations or um, spokespersons, if you will, these little agents of Christ that are actually engaged in our lives, in our relationships, in our communities, in the world around us, seeking to bring about change. Change that involves peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness and, and all the fruits of the Spirit so that the world can truly be changed. And as we've seen very pointedly, uh, in these past number of weeks with the conflict in Ukraine and all the other difficulties there are in the world, that the world really needs it. And so today we are looking at these aspects of passionate spirituality um, and why we do them. The reason why we do them, again, in helping to change us, is not just to change us in some random or arbitrary way, but in specifically helping us to take on the compassionate nature of Christ. And compassion is uh, a word we throw around a lot, and I think all of us have some understanding of what it means, but specifically, literally what to be compassionate means is, is to have passion with. It's to, to care about someone or something, but also, there's another component about that, it's also to be uh, compelled or moved or desire to act upon those feelings. So it's not just, you know, sort of thoughts and prayers, but it's to have thoughts and prayers about someone or something and to do something about it. That's what we see in Jesus. That's what we see in the nature of God. And so we seek to be like that in, in what and in who we are and how we act and how we think and how we live and how we speak and all the things that we do. So our particular scripture today is one that is probably one of the best known parables or stories that Jesus tells in all of his ministry. And that is the story, the parable of the prodigal son. And in this, we get wonderful insight into the nature, into the character of who God is. In this scripture today, hopefully it'll help us to understand that God is compassionate and so we should be as well. Now the story as it begins, Jesus uh, doesn't just immediately launch into this story, but he's telling it in a specific time, in a specific place, and for a specific reason. The Pharisees and other religious insiders, the, the religious elite of the day, had gathered around Jesus at this point. He's been in his ministry for a number of years, and they've begun to get an idea of who he is. They've seen that he's not someone that's just going to absently go away or just to not be a nuisance, but that he's there and that people are attracted to what he's saying and that they're, they're beginning to follow him. And because of that, they're beginning to be afraid. They're afraid of the way in which he's changing things, afraid of the, the sort of challenge to the status quo or to the norms of the day. And so 
they're beginning to speak out against it. They're beginning to try to, to squash Jesus and what he's doing. And so at this point in time, specifically what they're doing is they're admonishing Jesus. They're, they're being highly critical of him because he's associating with people who are considered to be outsiders people who are uh, religiously or socially unclean, people who are not seen as holy, people who have not uh, paid and to make the sacrifices that they need to. They've not done the things that they need to that also help to maintain the temple and those who are employed by it, by um, paying for offerings, paying for uh, the temple tax and the, um, all the religious fees that there were in the day. They're, they're not doing this. And Jesus is going out with these people, sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, people who are seen as being uh, co-conspirators with Rome, all sorts of people, even Roman centurions, Roman soldiers who were the oppressors there in their own country. Jesus is with these people rather than simply waiting for them to come to the temple and to make themselves right and go through all the process and pay all the money to do it. Jesus is going out to them. And so the Pharisees are like, no, this is unacceptable. This is not okay. You're, you're not doing it right. You're violating what God taught. You're violating the structure and practice and system that we've had established that we believe is biblically faithful and has been so for generations. And so in this, Jesus begins to tell the story of the prodigal son. Now there are books and books and books written, but just to give us a brief overview, we have the younger son in a family where we know only of a father, an older brother, and the younger son. The younger son comes to his father and says, Father, I want what is going to be mine um, when you die. I want my inheritance and I want it now. And this would have been, um, in today's culture, it still would be a big deal. But back then, that was horribly insulting and frankly, a social norm that people did not violate. Because really what that son was saying to the father in that day and age was, Dad, I wish you already did so I could have what's mine. And the father, um, amazingly, and in some ways that would have been absolutely shocking and horribly frowned upon by other people in the community, because what ideas it might put in their kids' heads, the father does it. And this isn't just a matter of liquidating stock or writing a check out of the checking account. Virtually all of the wealth at that point in time was held either by land, in land or by livestock. And so for the father to be able to have this cash, to be able to liquidate these assets, to give the son the money, he would have had to sell these things. So it wouldn't have been something that could have been done in private or in secret. People would have known about it far and wide. And so the father being willing to do this, to, to give this to the son, what he's asking for, he's bringing great shame upon himself. He's uh, putting himself in a very difficult position because of how other people are going to treat him, what they're going to say about them. And while we hear that the son, the younger son eventually goes away, the father has to stay there and deal with that has to live with that, and yet he's willing to do so. The younger son then goes off to a foreign land. We don't know where it is, but nevertheless, uh, our assumption is one that, that it's not a Jewish community, that he goes out to a place where he is truly in a foreign environment, that he, he leaves behind uh, all of his acquaintances, all that was known to him, and goes off somewhere else. And as he is there, it says he spends his money on desolute living. Now, that can be interpreted in a lot of ways. Later with the older son, we hear the older son saying he spent his money on prostitutes. We don't know whether or not that's accurate. But the point is, is that he spent the money in such a way that it, it wasn't life-giving. It wasn't wise. He wasn't uh, really helping himself. He wasn't really helping other people. He wasn't preparing for his future or doing things like that. He really squandered it. And at that point in time, after he had blown through all this money that he had gotten, this is a famine took place. And because of that, he was out. He was out of luck. He was out of money. He was out of resources. And he was truly at the mercy of those around him. And it says, and no one would give him anything. So because of this, what he had done, he had isolated himself from his community. He had isolated himself from his family and he had squandered what little he had. And then it says, and then he was able to come and to work for a pig farmer, helping us to know that it was a Gentile community um, where he was taken on. Um, this likely means not that he was hired as a, as a slave or hired as a servant or as a worker, but likely that this Gentile was just frankly willing to take pity on him and willing to give him some meager way of, of eking out an existence. And it's in that moment where for a faithful Jewish person, 
finding themselves where they're, they're slopping the hogs and they're doing this, that really would have been about the lowest that you could sink. You're with unclean animals, you're unclean among them, you are isolated from everyone and everything. I mean, what do you have at this point? I mean, your life is really about it. But it's in this moment he has a moment of clarity and he realizes that, what have I done? I mean, how, how foolish have I been? And he realizes that, well, maybe if I go back to my father, if I go back to my father and I throw myself at his feet, and if I grovel and beg his forgiveness, maybe he will be willing to welcome me back in, not as a son, not as a servant, possibly even as a slave, where I will be now property in the household, but at least my survival will be secured. And so it says he gets himself up and he goes and he's preparing um, to give this speech in his head as he is making his way back to his family home. But yet as he's coming back and as we hear about the father as he's returning back into the story, what's amazing for us about the father, which many believe, most believe, that this represents God for us, that the father is not waiting sort of in, in the main room of the home. The father's not sort of like sitting in a throne or some in grand receiving area, you know, maybe stewing about what happened or simply gone back to his life of luxury or whatever it is. But instead, this father is waiting, is waiting at the edge of the property and is looking out, hoping and praying, longing for his son to return. And eventually, as he does, as he comes back, the father then doesn't just wait, doesn't wait with arms crossed, waiting for the son to come and to grovel and to acknowledge all those horrible things that he had done to the father and to the family and all those he left behind. What the father does is the father runs. The father runs out and throws his arms around the son, hugs him and kisses him. Now, now this is rather emotional, even in our understanding today, but in that understanding, those people who would have been hearing Jesus tell this story for the first time, the elders and especially the oldest male in the family, you don't run. You don't run because in that day, and this is a little bit weird for us, you don't run because in running, um, you wear robes, sort of, not exactly like I'm wearing now, but a long flowing robe like I have on. And when you run, it, it flops up and it comes up in the wind and it would show like your, your legs and your ankles. and and that was horribly humiliating for them. I mean, it was to be seen in a great um, disheveled state. And so for the, the father being willing to do this, he was willing to embarrass himself. He was willing to shame himself again because he didn't care about these things. What he cared about was his son. And even as the son begins to offer his apology, the father welcomes him back in not as a slave, not as a servant, but as a fellow member of the family, giving him the robe and the signet ring and access to fully being included back as a member of the family. And he doesn't just do it privately and secretly, hoping that no one in the community would find out, but instead he does it lavishly. When it says it f killed the fatted calf, a fatted calf would, f keep, would normally feed, excuse me, about 150 people. So the father's telling us that a huge party where all the community is invited is going to happen. That this is going to be made known far and wide that this son of his who was dead is now alive and has been returned. And what great news that is. But that's not where the story ends. The story continues and at this point we have the older son entering into the story for the first time. The older son hears about all this commotion going on in what I imagine to be the main house as he's coming in from the field and asks a servant of the family, you know, what's happening? And the servant tells him. And at this point, the son is furious because he feels like, I mean, we can only imagine what he feels like, but that this younger son has taken advantage of the father, has humiliated the family and is now coming back, seemingly free from consequences. But then what's amazing is that the father leaves this main party and celebration to come seek out the older son as well. He does, and in doing that, in having the person who's at this highest level of position and status in the family, leaving that to come and to beg a lesser, even though it's the older son, 
he is still a lesser, begging him to come and be a part of this party shows that the father isn't just focused on the younger son, but he wants all of the family to be together, all of them to be reconciled and united. It's at this time the, the older son begins to be furious and say, I have done these things. I have worked and slaved for you for years and you have never done anything to celebrate me like you are celebrating him now. How ridiculous, how unfair is that? And the father says, you've always been with me. You're always here and everything that I have is yours. Your younger son was dead and is alive. He was lost and now is found. Let us celebrate that. Now, I think all of us can associate with different characters in this story at different points in our lives. I think whether it's the younger son, when we may be finding ourselves doing things that we aren't proud of and realize that. It may be the father when we find ourselves, it may be as a caregiver or a parent and the love that we have for our children or those other people who are close to us. And I think it's also particularly easy for us to find, us, find ourselves in the position of the older brother as well. My understanding of what's happening with the older brother is that he's missed the point, not just in wanting to celebrate the younger brother, but I feel like in some ways that the older brother has thought, well, if he does all of things, if he works incredibly hard, if he always does what his father asks of him, if he is dutiful and really sort of overfunctions in all these ways and more, that the father will love him because of that and will celebrate him because of what he does. What we see in the actions of the father is the father loves him anyway. The father loves him anyway and wants to be, him to be a part of the community, wants him to be a part of the family. But the older son has put himself in this position because he thinks he has to earn it, because he thinks it has to be because what he's done. I believe it's in this that we have revealed to us a powerful insight into who God is and what we're called to be in response. We aren't called to do good things. We aren't called to do the things that Jesus tells us to do, to pick up our cross, to follow him, to love God with all that we are, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to do all of these things, because if we do them well enough that God will love us because of that. God loves us no matter what, and there's nothing we can do that can change that. God loves you, God loves me, God loves every person on this planet, and we then do the things that Jesus called us to do. We seek to have the character and nature of God, of God in Christ, in response to that love. It's not a matter of earning it. It's a matter of responding out of joy and thanksgiving because of what has been done for us. So some of you may know that on Monday evenings during Lent, we're having a book study where we're going through the book Compassion in Practice by Frank Rogers, who is a professor at a seminary, Claremont Theological Seminary here in Southern California. He's actually gonna be with us for one of the sessions coming up. And in this book, he tells a wonderful story that helps to communicate this to us. So let me read that to us now. Frank says this, several years ago, a college student boarded a bus heading for home for spring break. Because the bus was nearly full, he sat down next to a man staring out the window. The man was middle-aged and dressed in denim. He bore the hard-edged look of someone haunted by a life he would rather soon forget. The man was not up for small talk. He was lost in himself. He simply gazed at the passing cornfields and farmhouses as the bus rolled along the two Lane County roads. A couple of hours into the ride, the hard-edged man grew agitated. Fingering his work cap, he stared down at the floor, only casting quick glances out the window as if not wanting to look too long. The college student asked the man um, if he was okay. The man regarded him, glanced once more out the window, then desperately shared his tale. 20 years ago, the man confessed, I killed a man. I was boozing it up, got inside a car, never saw the guy just crossing the street. I've been in prison all these years just thinking about it. I felt so ashamed. I sent a letter to my folks, told them that I knew I wasn't any good, that I was in prison, but I didn't tell them where. As far as they were concerned, they should consider me dead. I haven't seen or heard from them ever since. I got paroled a couple days ago. 
didn't have any place to go really. So I wrote my folks. I told them I was getting out. And I know I brought nothing but shame to them and our family, but I told them if they would have me, I would love to come home. I'd get it if they didn't want me back. So I'd make it easy on them. In our front yard is a big old oak tree. The bus drives right by our house on its way into town. If they would have me, all they got to do is tie a yellow ribbon around that tree. If it's there, I'll get off the bus at town and come home. If it's not there, I'll just stay on the bus and they don't ever have to lay eyes on me again. The thing is, now that we're getting close, I'm not sure I can bear to look. I mean, I get it. But if that oak tree is bare, why, I don't know what I'll do. The man started to look out the window, then he stopped himself staring at the floor instead. Then an idea came to him. Say he asked the student, would you mind looking for me? I'll just look the other way and you can let me know. The student agreed and the man swapped seats with him. The student scouted while the ex-con fingered his cap and stared at the floor. House after house passed by. Tree after tree was barren of ribbons. The bus drove closer to town. Then with a shout, the student saw it. Oh my God, you have to see this. The ex-con dared to look as the bus was passing his childhood home. A giant oak tree stood sentry in the yard. The tree did not bear a single yellow ribbon. It boasted hundreds of them, flapping in the breeze from every branch of the tree. An explosion of yellow ribbons proclaimed to the world, our boy is coming home and we cannot wait to embrace him. This is who God is. And this is who God wants to be for us. God doesn't want us to be people who keep our distance because we don't feel like we're good enough because none of us are. The amazing thing is that God loves us anyway. May we be able to receive this love of God for our sake and so that it might transform us into being those loving people that God has called us to be and God needs us to be for the sake of all. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we say so often, it is amazing that you know us better than we even know ourselves, and yet you love us anyway. And really, the fact that that's shocking to us tells us a lot more about ourselves than it does about you. Because you love us no matter what. You love us like a perfect parent, being able to see past all of those failings and difficulties and struggles and horrible things that we've done and yet you still love us. Help us to be able to receive that love. Help it to be able to work within us, to transform us, so that we too can then extend that same love to others. That we can be compassionate just as you are, being willing to love those people for whom there are countless reasons for why we shouldn't or don't have to, but yet still love them anyway, just as you continue to love us. Help us as we continue on this Lenten journey to enable us to open our hearts and minds to you, to be able to receive this amazing love that you have for us and to be changed in kind. As we pray these things, we also pray together saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Every time we gather for worship, no matter where we are, we are reminded of how blessed we are by God. And it is out of gratitude and with thanksgiving that we give back to God a portion of what we have received. With that, let us pray. O oh God, all that we have comes from you. Receive this offering and with it the offering of our lives, for we return to you only what you have so graciously given. Use us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Before we have our benediction, I would like to remind you that if you like the story that I read from the book by Fred Rogers, it's not too late to join our Monday evening book study that we're using this book for. Um, you can find out more information about how to do that on our website, or you can also call the church office, the phone number's on the website, uh, to find out how to be involved in that as well. We'd love to have you join us uh, for that time. And as we go forth from this time, as we go back to our lives and whatever waits for us there, Remember, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, really, truly, literally, no matter what, God loves you right now, right where you are, exactly as you are. May we all be able to receive that love and to respond in kind by seeking to share that love with others. In the name of the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer, amen.